God is good. God is good. Amen. So good. Today's text is from Luke chapter 9. We, we, are, we are in a series of messages from the Gospel of Luke. Our focus is encountering Jesus. That's what I'm praying today, that we will encounter Christ today. Amen? Uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 28 to 36. If you can all stand, you can follow along in your own Bible, but, or you can look up. We have an ESV on the screen. And let me read. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Verse 32, now Peter and those who were with him, meaning John and James, were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who, was, who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. When he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had Spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they have seen. And all God, this is the word of God given for us today. And all God's people say, thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Father, we come today. You tell us to come up. Come up to a higher place. So we may behold you. We may see your face. We may give you glory, God. So we come today. We worship you, God, through our praises, our giving. Father, we praise you as people of God gathered together. We come right now, God. We want to hear your voice. Speak to us. We listen. We want to see your face. Meet us here, God. We love you. We love you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. I hope you had good Thanksgiving. I hope you ate well. You know, one thing about Thanksgiving is, you know, a Thanksgiving holiday more than any other holidays, and I, want to call, I like to call it holy days, is that Thanksgiving, you know, remains, stays a long time. All the food that your wife, my, my wife, my mother in law cooked. That they, they cook so much, we have remnants each and next day, or two or three, or a week, or two or three, a month later, whatever it might be. That's good. And, 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 and I know why everybody goes to a gym after Thanksgiving Day. Just like me. God is good. So today I want to talk about the mountaintop. Let me begin by asking you this. Have you ever had a mountaintop encounter with God? Have you ever had a mountaintop encounter with God? Think about it. When that happened, what did God say? What did God speak to you? What did God show you? What did you see? What did you hear? What did, what did God speak? This is what this is about. Jesus took three of his disciples, not all 12, three of his disciples up the mountaintop. They were going to have mountaintop experience. 
they have never done before. And which Peter, one of them, one of them being Peter, will talk about 30 years afterwards. In all of them and change them forever. One of, you know, and when, when you worship on Sundays, Sundays, I'm amazed how God, Spirit of God works. You know, and one of the songs we sang this, this, this morning perfectly matches the message. Come up higher and higher, right? That, 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 that song? Love that song. It's good. Perfect. And I know somebody is hearing the voice of God this morning. And you're good job. Let me begin. It's when she, I, I want to, you know, I, I know this story well as a preacher, as a pastor, as a Bible study, Bible uh, student. I know this passage well, but when I went back and looked at it for today's message, there's so many things I didn't see. I want you to see something amazing here, which I saw, and I want you to be blessed by that. Look at verse 28. Now, about eight days after these sayings, he's telling you something here. And he says right here, eight days after these sayings, what sayings is this? About, about a week before, Jesus took disciples to Caesarea Philippi area, which is more, more of a Gentile area, and took the disciples apart and asked them. They had a midterm exam. Just two questions. When you have two exams, you, you miss one, you, are, you failed. You know, so first question, it was, what do people say that I am? And everybody, oh, some people say you are John the Baptist came back to life. Some people say you are Elijah. Some people say you are Jer Jeremiah. Oh, one of the prophets came back from old. Good, good, good. Everybody got it right. Good. Second question. You said, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And I bet you there was a little silence. And the big mouth, Peter, speaks out. This time was good. He said, you are the Christ, Messiah of God, the Son of the living God. He says, and Jesus, good job. Little Jesus, good job. You didn't get this only. God, the Father, revealed it to you. That was really that moment. And then Jesus began to teach. First time, now began to teach. First time that he has to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die and be rejected by the leaders and in three days come back to life. He's the first time he's beginning to reveal who he is a little more in detail. Yes, he is the Messiah, the promised Messiah from Old Testament. Now he, but yet he is different from what people, many people thought he would be. Begin to explain that, and I don't, I don't know whether we looked at it, but Peter says, no way, Jesus, you're not going to do this. And in, uh, and in other Gospels mention how Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. One moment he was a hero, got the right answer. Next moment he was, Satan, get behind me. You are not thinking about God's will, but you are thinking about your own. Peter get rebuked. And Jesus began to tell them, if anybody wants to follow up to me, they must deny themselves, carry the cross and follow up to me. If, you, if the Messiah is suffering Messiah who will suffer and die for the people, then following the Messiah means you need to embrace who he is. You need to embrace his calling in life even to suffer with him. Follow him. Eight days after this, Jesus, in they said, Jesus took with him Peter, John, and James and went up the mountain to pray. And I, let me, I need to stop here. And I, you know, we are house of prayer for everyone. Hope Church, okay? Whenever, I love gospel. Luke because it talks about prayer, life of Jesus more than any other gospel. Jesus goes up the mountain to pray. He goes mountain to pray all night long. And, you know, when he called the disciples, 12 apostles. And he prays before he got baptized. He prays all the time. Here, Jesus, important time in his life. He goes up the mountain to pray. And he takes, this is unusual, he took three disciples along with him. Not all the disciples, just three of them. The three amigos here. Three amigos in the Bible. Three amigos. This is interesting. In a, and out of the 12, some people say that's not fair. Kingdom of God is not fair. It's not about being fair. Jesus had inner circle out of 12 disciples. Out of many, he had 12. And out of 12, there are three that he will train more and he will equip them more. 
and he, those are Peter, John, and James. If you look at the Bible, three times, at least three times, Jesus took those three by themselves. When Jesus raised the Lazarus' daughter, he just took three of them in. Nobody else. And then when Jesus and the garden of Gethsemane, when he's praying, disciples are praying with him, but he went a little further, took three with him. Be near me. And when he prayed, those three came along. Here's another time that Jesus take three into the mountain, took them to the mountain top with him. You know, I thought about this. I never thought about this before. I asked this question. So why did, he, why did Jesus go up the mountain to pray? What did he go? What did he pray? What was he praying about? Why did he take these three guys? Not the other. Why did he take these three? I don't even have thought about that. But what a privilege it is, right? For two, those three guys. Out of the twelve, you, 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 follow me. I don't know, I don't know, know what happened. The Bible doesn't really say. It might be that Jesus said, All of you can come, but only three came. Maybe only three came. Then that could have happened. Or it might be just that I want you, you, and you to come. Whatever it might be, he took three of them up to the mountain to pray. Apparently, Jesus must have, must have prayed a long time because they're all falling asleep. When Jesus invited them to come and pray with him, be with him on the mountain, it was a privilege, isn't it? You see that in the Bible all the time. When, when, Moses went up to, when God told Moses to come up the mountain to receive the, 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 the word, the people were not allowed to come beyond the bottom of the mountain. And the 70 elders got to up a little higher. And, and, and then... After that, he only took, who, who did he take? Joshua up to the mountain. Only Joshua got to go up with Moses into the very mountain when God's glory comes. Here you see Jesus taking three of them into that mountain top. I want you to see what they saw. I want you to feel and encounter what they have encountered here today. I believe God is calling I feel like this is a prophetic word. I really believe God is saying, come up higher to all of us if you will receive it. Come up higher to see him, and behold him, encounter him. We are in this journey. Amen? So what did they encounter? One of the first things that happened was the word is transfigured. Look at verse 29. As he was praying, the appearance of his faith, Jesus' faith, was altered or changed. And his clothing became dazzling white. You know, they, when you look at other gospels, other synoptic gospel, Mark and Matthew, it gives a little more explanations, and they use different words here. In the Luke, it doesn't really use that word. It only says, he, got, he changed. It became different. That's all he says. But in Mark, it says in verse 2 of chapter 9, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. I don't have the verse here, but in Matthew's account, says, his face shone like sun. His clothes became white as light. And they use the same word, transfigured. The word transfigured, in Greek, the word is metamorpho. Metamorpho. Doesn't that sound like the word you know? Metamorphosis? It, which literally means you totally change in appearance. It means total change in appearance, like a caterpillar becoming a butterfly, a tadpole becoming a frog. Changed. But actually, that word is also has another meaning. Not only in appearance, but also change totally from inside out or transformation. That actually same word is used in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when it says, do not be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Being transformed there is not about appearance, change, change inside and out. Anyhow, that, that word is used here. Something happened. Jesus began, let's change in front of them. You see, you know, Jesus is praying. 
long time, and the disciples are anyway, just, just, fall, just falling asleep. You know, have you ever done that? Have you ever went to prayer meeting and fall asleep? Come on. I did many, many times. Be honest. I, you know, and I don't know how many times we would pray, and you know what? I'm here praying, and then, and I remember sometimes, so not snow. I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping in the, I'm praying and snoring. Come on. I, I'll tell you a funny story. This happened this week. I wanted to see the chosen movie. Went to see this, I think, did I go on Tuesday? I took my mother in law, we went to see a movie. You know, chairs were comfortable, and it was comfortable, right? I sat there, and my mother in law, and I, I, was, I felt like I was dozing off. First five ten, five, ten minutes, whatever. My mother in law felt so bad, she couldn't wake me up. And, uh, and so, because, you know, I'm a pastor, right? She, anyway, so she, she didn't wake me up. I, like, I woke up, oh, movie was good. But I fell asleep by first five, ten minutes. She said, you're snoring. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I was like, you're snoring. It happens. Like, they, were, they were sleeping away. You know, just like this, right? When, when Jesus was, the night before he goes to the cross in the Gethsemane, Jesus said, he's really troubled. He said, come along, pray with me. Pray with me. I need you to pray with me. And what happened? Those three are sleeping. Again, always sleeping. And so something happened in Jesus right? while they were sleeping. His face changed. What happened? He said his face shone, you know, and, and, and his clothes became bright like sun. What happened? It's almost like, you know, Jesus fully God and fully man on earth, right? He was fully God in human, in person. He sort of peeled his human form off. You can see God's glory coming out. You see that almost like, he's like, his superhuman suit off and the light coming out. And they begin, they saw glory of Jesus they have never seen it before. And he, and he goes back in. Anyway, so, so something like that. And so he has, they see the glory of Jesus. Amazing. Not only that, something has happened in that, in that, in that now before you go on, I need to, if, if, you, if you know the Bible, you know this brings back a story in the Bible, right? Face shining. What story does that come to your mind? Any, anybody? Who? Elijah? Moses, good job. In Moses, you know, in Exodus 34, when God, when God told Moses to come up the mountain again, because he first, uh, the Ten Commandments he received, he broke it because Israelites sinned. When he goes back up the mountain to meet God, and when he goes up, he spends time in God. He says, God, show me your glory. And God comes in the clouds and shows his glory to him. He, he hides him in the cleft, cleft of the rock so that he doesn't see him fully, only little portion. Somebody sang a song. I saw the backside of God. He only saw the little, God passed by. He didn't see the front, he saw the back of God. And his face was shining. What would happen if he saw the face of God? He would have died. He says, you cannot, nobody can see me and live. And he had God has to hide some portion of him, only show a little bit of him. And he saw the glory. And, he saw, and when he came down, his face was shining because he has been with God. Interesting, it's almost the same story here. Jesus goes to the mountain to pray to God. Why? I, 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 one, of the, one of the things I can think about is because he's going to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die. As a fully man, yet he's God, fully man, he didn't want to go. That's what he prayed on the Gethsemane. God, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. Jesus had to face this, what's happening in Jerusalem. He went up the mountain, God, Father, I need your help. He said, what do you want me to do? I want to do whatever you want me to do. He's praying while he's praying. And, and, and that he, God's, his glory shines while seeing God. That, that's what's happening going on. And something else happens right there and then. As, and then, behold, not only did he, did he shine and transfigure, but there were two people, two men, standing with Jesus, talking with him. There were Moses and Elijah. 
Is that a dream? Is that a vision? Doesn't seem like it. It is that Moses at least died about 1,500 years earlier. You know, and he went to the Mount, Mount, Mount Nebo, and he died, and nobody knows what happened to his body. But, you know, Elijah, about 900 years before, he didn't die, but then he was taken up to heaven on the chariots of fire in the whirlwind. And those two end up showing up. Some, uh, some commentator says, I, I agree. God the Father sent Elijah and Moses to encourage him, to remind him what you came to do or not. And so Moses, Elijah appears. So what are, so, so what are they doing? He says right here, who appeared in glory. They appeared in glory and spoke with him of his departure. What was it? What are they talking about? When they showed up, they were not doing some dance, whatever. What are they doing? They're talking to one another. And it seems like when you look at the language, they probably talked for a long time. This is what they were, you know, and they were talking a long time. And they're falling asleep, and this happened while they're sleeping. And he's, they are here in their glory. If Jesus is shining in light, they were probably shining in some kind of lesser light, and they were talking. And the, what are they talking about? It says, talking about his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. His departure. In King James, it, 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 it says his death, his disease. Okay? That meant departure meant, it also meant death. Some translation, like the literary says death. Holman, a uh, uh, contemporary English Bible says death. And good news Bible says Purpose of his dying. And, 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 uh, and ASB, ESB, and NIB says his departure, I meaning he's departing in Jerusalem. You know what that is. He's going to die in Jerusalem and, and he will cruci be crucified and he'll, he'll be resurrected and, and go back to the Father. That thing. This is what, what I didn't know. What I didn't know was the word departure is in Greek, exodus. You know what exodus is, right? That, oh, that means departure, Caesar, or that. But that Exodus is a word, the Greek, the, in, in Greek translation of the Old Testament, the book of Exodus, they use that word Exodus. Departure, that Exodus. It's talking about, they're talking about Jesus' ultimate Exodus, right, where God will redeem his people out of, out of bondage and set them free and bring them to the promised land. That ex ultimate Exodus will happen through the death of Jesus Christ. In Jerusalem. That's what they're talking about. What is God? I don't know if you thought about it. What is God thinking about? What is God talking about? We see a glimpse of God's heart. He's talking about how he came to save us. How he will die on the cross. Shed his blood to set us free from sin. And forgive us all our sins. And give us new life. And he will make us live in his glory in the Holy, Holy Spirit of God. This will happen, all accomplished in Jerusalem, all fulfilled in Jerusalem. Why Elijah and Moses? Because Moses stands for all the book of the law. And Elijah represents all the prophetic words. And what God is really saying here is that Jesus, what you're going to accomplish in Jerusalem is fulfillment of the law, is fulfillment of the prophets. Everything in the Old Testament talked about is about you going to the cross and dying. How glorious. How amazing. This is what in Luke 24, when you, after Jesus' resurrection, when two men walking away from Jerusalem going to Emmaus, remember those two guys, de despairing, dejected because Jesus died on the cross? Jesus talked with them and says, he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which you are, are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. This is what Jesus is talking about on the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, time has come. Jesus has revealed, reveal, begin to reveal that I'm going to go and die on the cross. I am the suffering servant whose prophet said, I'm coming. I'm the one. And that's what Jesus said. 
And there in the Mount of Transfiguration, God the Father sends the Moses and Elijah to confirm this is what the Bible says. So what Christ came to do. And, you know, the disciples needed to hear this. Because when Jesus said, I must, I must suffer and die, they, could not, they didn't understand. They thought the Messiah was to come as the conquering king will make all things right. Yes, he will when he returns a second time. But they didn't understand this Messiah is supposed to suffer. Now, with the word of God, the law of God, the pro- prophet, pro- prophetic words of God, fulfilled in Jesus as mentioned, confirmed through Moses and Elijah. That's why they showed up. How amazing, right? This is a vision, not just a vision. They, this is what they are seeing. You know, and Peter and John and James, they were sleeping, and then they sort of groggy. Oh, what is that going on? And they, the eyes popped open. Ooh, look at Jesus. Ooh, and who is like those guys? And they noticed it's Moses and Elijah. How did they know? How did they know it's Elijah and Moses? Was a picture in the synagogues? Of Elijah and Moses? No. How do they know? What do you think? How do they know? My guess is because they heard Jesus and Moses and Elijah talking. As they, they hear their conversations, oh, that's Mo- that one is Moses. That's Elijah. Also, in, and so they were, they were appearing in glory. So probably the conversation they heard began to hear. The sleepy heads wake up and fully awake. They see this thing. They saw something about Jesus. And, and, and they saw, you see, the mountaintop experience, encounter is seeing Jesus, our God, clearer. It's more than having some kind of body and experiences or not. Those are okay. But the thing is that the real mountain topic encounter with God is you get to see God clear. You get to understand God, who God really is. Begin to see him, his beauty, his glory. That's what holy mountain topic encounter is. Sometimes people have wrong ideas. I shake and I feel something in my head or whatever. Those are great. Those are always supposed to reveal something about God, something about our Lord, Lord Jesus. If does not do that, then so what? I shake and I fear something. It is about seeing him better, seeing him more, seeing his glory and beauty. That's what holy mountain, top of the mountain encounter is about. You're seeing Jesus clearly, understanding who Christ is. You know, Peter, just like Peter, he always says things that he shouldn't say. And sometimes, sometimes my wife said, I, I, I'm like Peter. Always put the foot in the mouth, right? And say the thing, wrong things at wrong times. Peter is in, he's a always, sometimes he says good things, sometimes he says wrong things. Wrong, that's what he does right here. He says, verse 32, Now Peter and those who were with him were, were heavy with sleep, and when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as, and as the men were departing, these two, Moses and Elijah, departing him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. so good to be here. Thank you for being us. so good to be here. Then from there on, everything goes back down. From then, everything goes down. Let us make three tents. One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And he says, no, John, no, the gospel look is nice. He didn't say, stupid guy. Well, he just says, not knowing what he was saying. What was wrong with what he said? What was wrong with what he said? It's so good to be here, Jesus. Let's build three tents for you. One for you, one for him, one for him. Why don't you stay here? What's wrong with that? At least two things. Let me start with the easiest one. What are they talking about? Jesus going to Jerusalem to die and fulfilling God's word. So why would you stay here when he has to go over there? That's one wrong. Second thing is this. He put Jesus in equal with Elijah and Moses. No. Jesus is not equal with Moses and Elijah, that's what this world wants to do. 
this woman would say, Jesus is like one, one of the other founders of the religion, like, same place with Confucius, same place with people like, you know, Joseph Smith or Mormonism, or whatever. They want to, oh, you know what Islam says? They say Jesus is one of the prophets. The greatest prophet is Muhammad. They want to put Jesus even underneath the Muhammad. No! You don't put Jesus equal with Moses, even Moses and Elijah, even though they are the big shots in Old Testament. They are no, you don't. Jesus is God in person. He is not just one of the people. He is not a founder of religion. He is God in our midst. He doesn't offer religion. He offers our relationship with God and that he will forgive us our sins and give us life. Not only that, through him, Holy Spirit of God lives and endures within us. That's what he, he doesn't give us religion. He gives us relationship with him. You don't put Jesus with anything else. He's not comparable to other things. You know what the uh, message version says, tasty version says? He blurted this out without thinking. He blurted this out without thinking. That's what MSG version says. And then then so something else something else happened. I you know some there are two 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 different school of thoughts. Glory cloud shows up. Cloud shows up right after this. And there are two thoughts why it happens. And some people say God was rebuking Peter, you dumb dummy. Or some people say, no, this God is really affirming, encouraging Jesus. You'd be the, you'd, you'd be the decider. Look at verse 34. And, he was, and as he was saying these things, a cloud came, overshadowed them. They were afraid as they entered the cloud. Cloud shows up and begin to come and overwhelm them. If you know the Bible, ding, 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 a bear should will go off. Cloud coming and showing up is a symbol of God's glorious presence. Remember when, when, when in, in the wilderness, when Moses and they built a tabernacle when they, when they finished. The glory clouds came into the tabernacle and people couldn't go in. When the King Solomon built his temple and when they, and when they dedicated it, God's glory came in like a cloud and they couldn't go in. And when Israelites were in the wilderness, God's pillar of clouds and the fire kind of led them. The clouds here symbolizes God's glorious presence in the midst of them, something else happens. A voice out of heaven comes. Voice out of heaven comes. This, there are three times in the Bible, God audibly speaks out of heaven over Jesus. When he, get, when he got baptized by John the baptizer, when he came out while he was praying, heaven opened, Holy Spirit came like a dove, and in heaven, out of heaven, God the Father speaks. This is my beloved son in whom, in whom I'm well pleased. Here he says in verse 35, a voice came out of heaven, out of clouds, saying, this is my, my son, my chosen one. I like the word chosen. My chosen one. And it's a little different now. Listen to him. Listen to him. He is the fulfillment of Old Testament and New Testament. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophet. He is God's Messiah, God's Son. God's Son, listen to him. Why wouldn't you listen to him? When you see God's glory, when you see Moses showing up and Elijah showing up, you see God's glory come, all that. Why wouldn't you listen to him, Jesus? And 30 years later, Peter, now he's an old man, and really an apostle, a witness of Christ Jesus, his resurrection, says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6 and through 18, he says, For we did not follow cleverly devised fables, tales, fables, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty, for when he received honor, glory from God, the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic 
glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves have heard this utterance made from heaven when you we were with him. Where? On the holy mountain. He's recounting 30 years down the later. We saw God's glory. We saw God the Father speak out of heaven, de declaring his glory. Remember all this. And he declares this thing. Let me read one more. Okay, go, let me go to the last verse, then I, and I want to summarize. And when the voice has spoken, Jesus was alone. The Moses and Elijah is gone. The cloud is gone. And they kept silent. And they told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Sometimes your encounter with God is so amazing, so utterly amazing. You don't know what to tell people about it. You are, you are too scared to say anything. You know, I don't know what they don't understand. Sometimes God says, you know, don't not tell anybody about you yet. You share only when God says it's okay to share. I remember when I, when I, when I had my uh, uh, Holy Spirit fullness experience, my first time in my life in 1981, the experience is so, so bizarre to me. I couldn't tell people for a long time. It sounded weird. Because when, when I experienced Holy Spirit of God at the time, my body was shaking, my body, I fell down on the ground, and all kinds of things were happening. I don't know how to tell people about it. Sound weird. Sound weird. And so I didn't tell people for a long time. I had to think about what they what would, and of course, God changed something in me, but I couldn't tell people about it until later, what that meant, what was going on. Here, Jesus said, actually, other gospel say Jesus said, to not tell people yet, not yet. Time will come and you can tell people about what happened here. This is an encounter that Peter and John had and on the mountain. You know, and so that, I said, I thought about this. Why did Jesus go up the mountain to mountain to pray? Because an important, significant time had come for him to reveal who he was, what he was going to do. A new, direct, new season in, in his ministry had come. He, he came to talk to the Father and even though he knew all things, he will talk to the Father and be with the Father. And Father God encourages him, sends you know, Mo Moses and Elijah and encourage him and, and strengthens him. You are doing good. And God the Father speaks out of heaven saying, my chosen son, you are doing good. You are right. That's one interpretation about the cloud. The other people are saying, Peter, stupid. What I, I talk to you, he's the same as Moses and Elijah. No, he's my son. Was, was God rebuking Peter? I don't think so. But the father was saying to the son, you're on the right path. You're doing good. He went up the mountain to seek father because he wanted to walk in God's way, father's way. And he, why did Jesus take the disciples up the mountain? They need to hear and see what Jesus will show them. See who Christ really is. Who, who he is, what he came to do. Secondly, they will need to see it, be an eyewitness of what Christ revealed them. They'll witness down the line. One for, first for the revelation, second for equipping and training. You can minister to others. For the two, two purposes. God, Jesus brought them into the mountain, revealed revelation, deeper revelation about who he is. Secondly, train them and equip them to be his witnesses, to love and serve and, you know, and, and really do what God called them to do. So I'm going to end here. I'm going to summarize here. I've had a praise team come. Um, let me summarize here, put things here. In so what does this mean to us? My what God is really whispering in my heart is, you or we, not you all, we all need to go up to a mountain of transfiguration. We all need to go up to the mountain. We all need to go up to the mountain to see his glory, see who he is. See who he is. 
He's the fulfillment of the Old Testament law and the prophets. See who he is. He's the one who will suffer on the cross and die for us, who will bring us ultimate exodus, salvation, and redemption. We all need to come up to the mountain to behold him closer and see his face and see his glory for the new revelation and understanding of who God is. We all need to, second, we all need to come up to the mountain that he may transform us, make us more like him, and prepare us for his glory. This is what God has given me. I want to declare it. I don't know. You you think about how it uh, really speaks to you. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. Out of the blue, God put this word in my heart. It says, after these things, it's a revelation, John the apostle is saying this, I, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of trumpet, speaking with me said, come up here and I'll show you what must take place after these things. Come up here. I will show you the things what must take place after these things. I really believe God is saying, time to come up. Higher ground. Second thing, as I mentioned, and he, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says this way, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual acts of service of worship. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorpho, transfigured, transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you know what is the will of God, what, what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Be transforming your mind. I believe God is saying, come up here. We need to go up the mountain. We may see Christ. And we may be transformed. Then you know what he will do? Send us back down. Do not stay in the mountain anymore. Go back down. He, he brings you up to the mountain so that he will send you out. You, you, you come to meet God and you encounter God so that he will send you out into the world, send you out into the Jerusalem, send you out to go and serve and love and, and, and do what he called us to do and love as he called us to love. I believe he is calling many of us to come. Come up here. Come up here, he says. Our oh, Lord, our God is here. I'll be very honest. Today I feel so free in the spirit. Speak God's word. You know, you know, every Saturday night until Sunday morning, I'm terrified of what I'm preparing. I feel like it's never good enough. I'm terrified. And I want to speak God's word. And I was so fearful this morning. And I come as I, as I speak God's word today. I sense this is the right word for us. And he's speaking to us. He's here right now. So come up here. I'll show you what must happen after these things. Let's all stand.